and welcome architectural acoustics so the question is you you want to have a look at these db things i mean th there is going to be dbs coming up later on but uh, the thing to understand about decibels is that it is a way of measuring relationship rather than absolute value. Okay, so we actually measure the ratio. So in terms of relationship, and this is something that will come back with musical intervals, um, it's not a difference type relationship. It's a ratio type relationship, if that makes sense. So my favorite example to kind of you know, uh, recontextualize this is measuring age in decibels, right? So we typically measure humans' age by absolute value, and we typically call the relationship in age also by absolute difference between two absolute values. However, it's not necessarily the best option. That's what I'm going to try to demonstrate with the following horrible example, which is uh, age difference between mating humans. Okay? So, if I say, let's say, uh, I'm 40, actually just a few days now, thank you. Uh, so, what would be the youngest female I could mate with without causing uh, social upheaval? Are we, we are here in Bristol. 16. <laughs> no, but that would cause, I mean, if I, you know, if you saw me in a pub with a 16-year-old girl snogging, you'd probably be like, okay. Yeah, it'd be questionable, but the police would be okay at that. Yeah, but you're not the police. I'm, I'm asking about social norm. Uh, 30. 30? Yeah. yeah? Come on, 28. Can I do 28? <laughs> Give me a 28. Okay, so that means that... Uh, the age difference in the way we normally do this would be 12. Right? Now, what's your age? 22. 22. So what, happen, what would happen if you <laughs> dated someone who's 12 years younger? That even police would, you know, find an issue with that. Okay? So this is an example that shows you how it's not necessarily the best way of figuring out the relationship in age. And the nice thing is that if we use decibels, <coughs> this will pan out differently. So Super Collider is my favorite uh, calculator. It synthesizes sound as well, luckily. Um, so you've probably seen this equation already. You might uh, get to see it again. But in essence, what we do is we take the ratio. So if I'm allowed a 28-year-old mate how do i figure out the the db uh, of this ratio it's log 10 and then it's 20 times that okay so it's 20 times log 10 of the ratio so actually the decibel difference is 3.1 decibels okay so now if i do the same thing but i take your age, which is 22, and quite unlikely age of your mate, which would be 10, that's 6.9 dB difference, 6.8. Okay? So it kind of tells you that it might be better. So actually what I can do, I won't go into the maths of inverting this uh, at this stage, but I can just play around with it and try to figure out what would be 3.1 dB age difference uh, for you if you're 20. So. I would guess like 16 should be about right. And actually 16 is even a bit less. Okay, but you, you get the idea here. So, so you're expressing ratio. And it's a good example because it shows something that we're really used to. You know, figuring out people's age and age difference. But you see that actually the, the perceived relationship in age is kind of closer to dB scale rather than the absolute difference. Make sense? Okay, so that's, that's the, this kind of, okay, let, let's open it up, recontextualize this. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to look at briefly as a matter of uh, recall, hopefully, uh, was musical intervals. Okay, so what's the case here? Again, 
instead of having a fixed difference that describes an established fixed relationship, we have a fixed ratio. Okay? So we cannot express, for example, the relationship of an octave with a difference. Right? We can only express it with ratio. What is the ratio of an octave? Two. Two. Yeah. So whichever frequency you start with, the octave on top will be twice that frequency. Right? And if I start at 400, it will be 800, so the difference is 400. If I start with 1,000, the octave will be 2K, so the difference is 1,000. So you see that the difference is not fixed. It is the ratio that is fixed. Okay? So the question arises, what is the ratio of a semitone? All right, so what am I looking at? I'm looking at dividing the octave into 12 equal bits. It's 112. But it's not. Is it 4.5? Uh, nope. So we, I, I'm looking... Excuse, excuse me? Okay. No. Nope. No. Uh, so if you say 112, you kind of got the first half right because you understood that it should be 12 equal parts. Now, if I take 112, what I will get is a fixed difference, right? So I'm back at uh, absolute difference, but instead of having a fixed difference, what do I need? I need a fixed factor, right? So I need a factor, a multiplier, which applied 12 times gives me what? Number two, two. yeah. You see? So I cannot divide, because you see, if I was to say, okay, I have an octave between 400 and 800, and take 1 twelfth, right? I'll get these equal steps, and if I have an octave from 800 to 1600, it's going to be a totally different number anyway, right? So that won't work. So I need a factor, a multiplier, which applied 12 times give me 2. So it means if this multiplier is x, I need x times x times x times x times x. Do this 12 times, and the result is 12. So what is x? One six. No. Three. No. This is the fun bit of the class when I get to say no, 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 no. So if I want to divide it in two equal parts, the octave, right? So I have x times x equals 2. What is x? No. It's the square root of 2. Right? So the square root is the operation which is the inverse of uh, squaring. Right? So x times x equals 2 is the same as x square equals 2. Right? So what would that be? Shall we do this math? So let's say I have an octave 440 to 800. 880. Okay, so what do I do? I have to figure out the square root of 2, that is 2 to the power of 1 half, that's 1.41. Okay, so what I do then is I multiply 440 with this square root of 2, and I get 622. And how do I verify this is all good? Well, I do the same multiplication once more, and the result is 880. Okay, so now I've divided the octave into parts. So what would be dividing it in 12 parts? I have to take the 12th root of number 2. Okay, it sounds esoteric, I guess. What is the 2 stars? What 2 stars is exponentiation here. Oh, okay. So it's 2 to the power of 1 half. Okay, so that's, that's how, how you can do uh, arbitrary roots. You just take a power to the number lesser than 1. Okay, so what I do then is I take 2 to the power of 1 twelfth, right? The top one was 2 to the power of 1 over 2. Here it is 2 to the power of 1 over 12. So the ratio of a semitone is 1.059. And a semitone above 440 is 466. 
Okay. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure this is going to be hugely important in the rest of your life, unless you're trying to charm uh, a young music technologist, uh, age 3 dB and less. Um, but there you go. That's, that's the kind of thing that I think, you know, it, if you get it, it kind of makes you feel, aha, I've learned something, hopefully. Okay, that's that. Uh, cool. Let's get on with today's bit, waves. Uh, so the first thing, well, a bit of an overview. Although I must say that overviews are killing you more than anything, believe it or not. In fact, I had this idea. The problem is that um, having access to everything actually demotivates us, right? So the real good way of learning things is um, going through a labyrinth, a maze, more so than seeing the table of contents, as I think I mentioned last time. But never mind that. Here's the table of contents. I kill you. Uh, so, sound waves, should I read this out transmission? We'll come to it. Okay, so sound waves. What are sound waves? First question. Are we looking at waves of particle motion? Or are we looking at particles of wave-like character? So what is sound? Are we talking about particles or are we talking about waves? I think we kind of discussed this last time, if my memory serves me right. Which it doesn't. Any other ideas? Any other ideas? Neither. Neither. Any other ideas? Neither. The final fourth option is both. <laughs> do you care? It looks like you do. Uh, so what is a wave? It is a product of the mind. And in fact, it's the, at this stage, it is product of my vocal tract. Wave. Okay, so I would like you to consider that uh, what we do is we produce models that more or less uh, predict uh, what's going to happen. However, to claim that the reality is a model is kind of flawed, right? So I, I refrain from saying that sound is wave or that it's a particle, sound is this among other things okay so the point with this duality actually is that we have a useful model of particles which relates to our uh, conception of arrows in terms of motion right and we have a useful model of waves which uh, has to do with our concept of uh, essentially concentric circles or spheres Okay, so you can think of sound as something that travels in a straight line, described by an arrow. And you can think of sound as the pond surface when you throw in a pebble, which creates concentric circles that depart from the center. When do we do which? Do we do either? Do we do both? Any ideas? We typically do both. And we typically use the arrow metaphor if we uh, observe higher frequencies. And we typically use concentric circles uh, visualization when we, cons when we look at lower frequencies. Okay? Uh, typically, in our acoustic environment, we have a situation whereby uh, sound sources that project high frequencies are more directional anyway. And sound sources that produce low frequency are more omnidirectional. So that kind of makes sense. But the point is that sound is neither. Actually, sound is a bit like... Uh, um, it's, it's actually a behavior. Okay? It's a behavior that catches on. Right? So if a particle has a certain uh, vibration pattern, an air particle, then the next one will kind of take that pattern over. It's, it's kind of viral. Okay, so th that's what we're looking at. And th the, the important thing here is that I kind of talked about this 
in the intro <laughs> is not to conceive uh, sound uh, to be very similar to light, right? Typically what we have with light is very clear shadows, right? You kind of see it. That light source is being shadowed by my arm here. But with sound it's not like that, right? If I do this, I'm not completely shadowing the sound coming out of my vocal tract. So, so it's slightly different in that sense. And what, what happens thus is that we get a very complex sound field in rooms, in space. And I typically propose that you think of it uh, as an ocean surface in 3D, if that kind of makes sense. So it's a lot of detail in every different uh, location. Right? So it also highlights uh, the problem with point sources as, you know, as, as a basic paradigm of uh, sound and acoustics because, and, and evidently point sources and point receivers. Okay, so we're kind of inclined to believe that if I have the most expensive microphone and the most expensive speaker and I record sound, that I've actually done everything possible to reproduce that sound. But this is not the case, because I'm using a point receiver and I'm using a point source. I mean, they're not... The, if I had a point source and a point receiver, it would be a bit better, but actually these membranes have their, you know, spatial uh, extent, so it's even worse than that. Okay? But if you think of any uh, sounding object, right, it actually projects a different spectral characteristic in all possible directions. Right? So it's much richer than that. So if I, if I use, again, the metaphor of the uh, ocean surface, I could say that I'm trying to describe the surface of the ocean by looking at elevation of the surface at a single location. And if you're a surfer, any surfers here? <laughs> you know that it won't tell you anything, really. You really need to have an overview of all the waves coming in in order to assess, you know, your, uh, your surfing uh, potential. Okay? Now, part of the reason why we do this with point sources and point receivers is that in acoustics, which is kind of branch of physics, uh, people like to do a lot of calculation, equation, and this simplification uh, allows us to set up a lot of cool equations. If we didn't simplify it like that, we'd be in trouble. Okay, and there is, I mean, point source is actually, uh, I shouldn't spend that much time on this, but who cares. Uh, a point source would be a sphere that expands and contracts in all possible directions while remaining a point, funny thing. But actually, if you uh, dig a bit further, what we have is pistons <coughs> as a piston. Piston is a, is a moving surface back and forth, which is already much more complex than a point source, if you, if you look at the math of it, okay? which is called a dipole. It kind of has two poles, so to speak. But I won't go into... Th this is just a kind of a taster of, uh, you know, foundation of acoustics. If you were to open one of the books in the reading list that really starts from the basics, kind of, um, of physics, of acoustics, you'll probably encounter these things. So just, you know, what to look out for. Okay, uh, so a uh, few facts here. Waves are necessarily disturbed by measurement. Okay, maybe minutely, maybe it's not significant. Okay, but the point is that if you put a microphone in a room, technically, theoretically, you are changing the sound in the room, believe it or not. It's, it's not huge, but <clears throat> if you want to get technical about these things, this should be clear. But okay. all waves are, distur are disturbing, so some of them are... Uh, say that again? All waves are a disturbance, like 
even like infrared waves and ultra well th that's the thing i mean you would have uh the the model of photons right so a photon is supposedly a particle of light right but then again uh light uh is a motion of wave of of, of these particles that uh, that is uh, transferred from one to the other. So I'm, I'm not great in physics, and if you di dig in quantum physics, then the explanation is a different one altogether. Okay, so it, it, it is all approximation, it is all a set of models that we use in order to supposedly understand it, but actually just model it. A good example for it is, is gravity. Okay, so you probably learned something about what gravity is at some stage. And you were probably told that it has to do with acceleration and mass, right? Yeah. So actually gravity is a fixed acceleration, if I'm right about this. In elf. Huh? In elf it is. In elf? In elf. Here on planet elf. Oh, planet Earth, yes. Uh, well, ob obviously also on the moon, but it's just slightly less or significantly less. But the point is that about 100 years ago now, a physicist came up with a better model, according to them, whereby gravity is an integral of time space. So if you, if you ask a decent physicist about gravity, he will tell you about integrals of time space. And uh, if you so, so, so the, the model that we still conceive of as valid is actually obsolete since 100 years now. Nevertheless, it's a good enough approximation. And there is no one who can state for sure that within the next 100 years, someone will not make the integral of time-space concept obsolete in terms of explaining gravity. Okay, so don't take science to be the absolute truth. What is truth? Anyone? Truth is a neurological phenomenon. It's something that happens in monkey brains. Yeah, and you can have, uh, you probably had already, a really strong sense of truth out clubbing, and the next day you're like, hmm, <laughs> I'm not so sure about that anymore. Okay? Maybe you had another sense of truth, or you had a sense of absolute lack of truth, <laughs> which is probably even more likely. It's like nothing is true anymore. <laughs> Right? So it's a neurological phenomenon, and you can, you can trigger this in many different ways. Right? Typically, there is a cognitive component to it, but there is a very strong emotional component. You have to trust. You have to be in the state of increased uh, emotional affection, really. If you, if, you, if you don't feel emotional affection, you won't feel truth. Okay? So I won't go into that. Uh, cool. So wave mechanical disturbance of a medium fluctuation, audible waves. This is a funny one. Can you hear 5 hertz? No. Any other ideas? I mean, you guys should know it by now if I ask such a question, right? So the question is, when can I hear 5 hertz? So you can feel it. Does it be able to process it, maybe? Or it will reject the processing of that wave? Keep thinking, keep thinking, yeah? If it's strong enough or loud enough, it will be moving things around. And it's still not there, still not there. Any other ideas? Well, I hear it if it's not a sine wave. That's probably about 4 hertz. Okay, so we don't hear sine waves at 5 hertz. But 5 hertz square wave is something I definitely will hear. But is it just like 5 hertz then, if it's a square wave? Of course it's 5 hertz. It's a, no, it's hertz is not a, a unit that relates only to sine waves. If I say this piano has a pitch at 440 hertz, it's not a sine wave, it still has a frequency to the fundamental. It's not a pure 5 hertz frequency. Uh, no, it's not a pure sine wave, but it's still 5 hertz. So the hertz does not uh, exclude things other than sine waves. But, hertz you, but you won't be hearing just the 5 hertz, you'll be hearing more frequencies. Well, I'll be hearing a pulsation. Right? So that's the point, that there is a continuum between pulsation and frequency. 
okay? And it is uh, characteristic of monkey brain to be able to distinguish events below about 20 per second and to not be able to distinguish events above 20 events per second. Instead, if you have a regular 20 events per second, you will start to perceive low frequency pitch. Okay, so I can hear 5 Hz. I don't hear it as a pitch. And if it's a very pure sine wave, I won't hear it at all. Agreed? Cool. Fun things. Fun fact. But it, it kind of highlights, you know, the, the necessity to investigate and to keep your critical thinking switched on. Right? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the point of this is not that you learn more facts. The point of this is that you acquire a skeptical approach. Okay? A pulsation. pulsation. Well, this this is fun. Uh, well, by showing you one, for example. Yeah, it's 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 a regular event sequence, something like this. Okay. Do we hear thirty k? Now I'm stretching it. Well, the funny thing is, we'll probably come to that in psychoacoustics, but I'm happy to roam around. The interesting thing is, you can do this as a matter of experiment already, is that uh, the interaural time difference, so the time difference between the two ear arrival that we are sensitive to is down to 10 microseconds, which corresponds to 100 kilohertz frequency. So even though I don't hear a 30 kilohertz wave, if I don't have this precision encoded, the spatial detail of the encoded sound will be lesser. Okay, so you can do this as a matter of experiment. If you have a beautiful concert hall with very well-spaced musicians, you have an amazing stereo pair, and you record higher sample rate, lower sample rate, again, amazing reproduction system, everything top-notch, you should be able to hear that the spatial detail is lesser for a lesser uh, sample rate. So it's, it's a funny thing because evidently you don't hear the frequency. How many, uh, what's the difference, like, in how, like, what's the threshold of which you hear it if you're recording 44 and if you're recording... Uh, there are no thresholds. It's a continuum and it's a questionable whether you hear it or not hear it. If you're a trained listener, you should be able to hear the detail of spatial encoding, and if you are unlike me, you know, protecting your hearing. I'm kind of half deaf myself. If I, if I take the headphones and put them the wrong way around, it's a different tune, pretty much. Or at least a different mix. So uh, it's, it's kind of touchy, but in any case, there is some evidence that this, um, this time duration is something that we are sensitive to even if we do not hear frequencies at that period duration. Well, how, how is it relating to 30k? Uh, to what? How does it relate to 30k, 30k hertz, if we can hear it or not? Felt decay? I don't understand. 30, 30. Ah, 30k? Yeah. Well, that's what I said. So if 10 microseconds corresponds to 100 kilohertz frequency. Mm -hmm. huh? So if there is a time anomaly related to 100 kilohertz, then it will mess up the spatial perception. Right? Cool. Uh, mediums, typically gas, solid, liquid. We'll talk about this in a second. Okay, so how can we conceive of uh, sound waves? One of simplified models is balls on a spring. Uh, okay, so there is some intermolecular force that uh, is between the balls, between air particles, which kind of makes them interact. And if you, if you visualize this, you would probably imagine, this should actually be a, an animation probably, that if I disturb one ball, then slowly uh, next, next door balls will be disturbed. And it will take some time for the disturbance to reach the 
last ball. Okay, so you can use this model to kind of try to visualize what's going on. Uh, and there's ways we describe this in terms of kinetic energy, and uh, obviously it should be in 3D as well. Okay, the term that we also use for uh, uh, sound in air is compression, okay, which is something that makes sense in this uh, case, and rarefaction which also makes sense. So when the balls are closer together, they're compressed. Where they're further apart, they're... Uh, I shouldn't try to extrapolate that word. Okay, so here is a sketch of how this uh, looks like in time. So if I have a compression top left, then what you get is that that compression kind of travels in the medium. Okay? And around that compression, or essentially behind that compression, I get a rarefaction in the medium. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. And this is what we typically describe with uh, signal, which is something you see there on top. Now, the thing is that we hear, I'll come to that in more detail, but the question here is, what am I... Uh, uh, displaying in the curve, in the kind of square waves there. You see, that is the distance between the balls. Does that make sense? Or, in fact, it's the inverse of the distance. So if this is a compression, I kind of have a positive value there. And if behind it it's a rarefaction, I have a negative value there. Okay? So it also uh, should help you visualize how the characteristics of the medium will influence the velocity of the wave. Okay? So if we have a stiffer spring, we will have faster transmission. Okay? And if we have heavier bolts, then the transmission is slower. Okay? So the medium is largely responsible for the velocity of sound waves. Okay, you probably know velocity is typically something we uh, express as distance over time. And this is what we call a traveling wave. Okay, in opposition to a standing wave, which is something we will come to later. Okay, so traveling wave, you kind of imagine it starts somewhere, goes uh, forward, something like that. Okay, so what we are then... Uh, saying is that in analogy to this compression and rarefaction, what we, uh, the term we use in acoustics are pressure waves. Okay, so if the two imagined balls are closer together, the pressure is higher in the analogous domain of air particles. Okay, so when the balls are closer, when air particles are compressed, you get higher pressure. So actually what we had... Uh, just a second ago, in terms of that traveling square-looking wave, we had a pressure wave, okay? Uh, and this is typically what we hear, okay? We hear pressure waves because pressure exerts force on the membrane in your ear, okay? And then that gets transmitted and so on, so forth. Uh, so what we have is... Uh, force that um, essentially uh, is established between these molecules, don't imagine these molecules colliding, okay? That would be nuclear domain. We're not really there, okay? So typically, in order to simplify things sufficiently, to make some sense, we consider a homogeneous medium, right? Which means that in every location, the medium has the same characteristic. Okay, uh, but <coughs> this is rarely the case. Okay, it is never actually homogeneous. It's always some kind of flux. Okay, so you can imagine turbulence and flowing wind, things like this happening in the meanwhile, which actually makes things much more complex, right? So what we are considering always is a, is a serious simplification. Okay, as far as the solids go, they can be rather homogeneous, but technically never totally homogeneous, uh, so these are the approximations that we work with. Uh, 
Now, if we start to understand acoustics, we will typically also simplify the geometry of objects and what's going on. So we will consider air columns as a one-dimensional vibrating systems similar to strings, membranes, plates as a two-dimensional vibrating system, even though they have some thickness, which is significant. So just to prepare you for, you know, we are looking at very simplified models here, uh, which could be quite exciting. Okay, briefly about solids, here's your first equation. Now, I'm not going to hammer too much on equations. One thing I really hope you will uh, find uh, easy to understand and very useful is proportion and inverse proportion. Okay, so when you look at the equation, uh, which has uh, a ratio expressed, then you can visually recognize proportion and inverse proportion, okay? So everything that is above <coughs> the imagined, uh, what's the name of this <coughs> line? The ratio line, is there a better name? Probably. Um, uh, everything that is above is proportional. Okay, so Young's modulus is proportion to velocity. When two uh, units are proportional, what you get is that the increase of one yields the increase of the other. Okay? When they are inversely proportional, it means that the increase of one causes decrease of the other. Okay, so actually, what you should be able to derive from this is, for example, that if the density of the material is higher, rho, then the velocity of sound in that medium is lower. Okay, so that's inverse proportion. Okay? So when you, when you see an equation like this, I, I won't ask you to do much with it. Just be able to read these, these important relationships between these units. Okay? Uh, so it tells you also, for example, something you might have known already, that uh, speed of sound in solids is much higher than in air the density of solids is much higher than air. Okay? Um, the density is higher, so it should be lower, isn't it? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, makes sense. Cool. Uh, so in air, typically, we're looking at 344 meters per second. Okay? So that's something we... I mean, we won't necessarily calculate with it, but it, it is useful. I, I'm typically keen on on understanding or kind of getting a grasp on uh, basic uh, uh, j just being able to ballpark certain values okay uh, sorry for that come on get gone okay so kind of being able to ballpark things you know knowing basics here we'll come to that the due course okay so temperature increase lowers density so you can get the conclusion from that. And speed is not affected by pressure, as a matter of fact. Uh, so the molecular weight and the absolute temperature will be crucial in terms of uh, velocity of sound. Okay, so water molecules have lower weight, increased speed of sound and therefore also with humidity. Okay, so if you have, if you're in a room which is humid, uh, as if there was another option, then you would have an increase in sound. Okay, oceans, really interesting. Ocean acoustics is a huge chapter, lovely things. Uh, if you're interested to read a book about it, go ahead. We won't go into that. In essence, what we have is transmission of very efficient transmission of very low frequencies. You might know about whales communicating over huge distances at very low frequencies. Interesting things. Uh, one of the things that is not necessarily um, well understood is the property of a surface, which is a medium boundary. Okay, we'll talk about medium boundaries, but in essence, the thing that we um, don't necessarily intuit is that the boundaries are reflective. Uh, if 
the impedance drops as well. So I'm going to talk about impedance, but just for now, you can imagine that this wall is reflective. That's not an issue. But actually, if the sound travels in the solid material and tries to exit, so in other words, if I inverse, if I'm not asking whether wall is reflective uh, in relation to air, I'm asking whether air is reflecting in relation to the wall, it is also true. Okay, so because of the boundary, it is not just that the harder, the more solid material is reflective, but the less solid material is also reflective. Okay, so we'll come to that uh, later as well. Oil can delay liquids, funny thing. And just so you know, in fact, I think I, I was really fascinated by oil can delays, which is kind of an analog thing with oil inside. And it's a guitar effect from the 50s, 60s. But there wasn't much out there. And I think recently there's someone on YouTube built it and kind of did cool things with it. Once I had a, a final year project guy doing it as well, but he kind of went in a different direction. Okay. Blah, blah, physical laws. I don't know if I want to be very philosophical uh, at this stage uh, or stay philosophical. But uh, I would be an opponent of the term law of physics. Uh, law is a, a term that comes from essentially social organization, right? Initially religious and then uh, jurisdictional. Uh, th there is no real evidence that our extrapolation in terms of time-space is valid. Okay, so we have great experimental data on local uh, time-space, which we occupy, and we have a huge amount of brainy people uh, who try to extrapolate this and conclude what the hell is going on light years away. And evidently, it's a complex thing, and there's some evidence, there's some lack of evidence. But typically, what you get in physics, especially in the theoretical physics, is that there is a primacy of equations. So if the equation necessitates a concept, they are not reluctant to introduce it. Okay? I have a slightly different uh, position here. Uh, I, I tend to distinguish uh, products of the mind and actual reality. So my distinction is if I bump my head against it, it's real. If I cannot bump my head against it, it's kind of not real. And there's something in between in terms of microscopic evidence and stuff like this. But uh, a wave is something that I don't bump my head against. Okay, so a wave is a concept. It's a product of the mind. By the way, I love products of the mind possibly more than, you know, material stuff around me. So there's no issue with this. It's just that making the distinction can be quite valuable. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit philosophical. So, but Please. if you bump your head against something, yeah. how do you know it's still real? Because, like, is it the pain? Because pain will be the product of your mind. Uh, the thing is that you, uh, you have to, you have to, you don't have to, but it is preferable that you have a baseline. You have to have certain axioms in order to deduce anything. And uh, uh, evidence is also related to the word evident. So if we do not consider what is evident to be real, there's nothing else we could consider to be real. So for me, this is the baseline. What is evident? What, what is, you know, repeatable in that sense? You know, I bump my head against it multiple times. So, for example, if I'm uh, depressed, I would say that it's not necessarily something I will bump my head against each time I confront it. Whereas if I take this door, I'll probably bump my head each time. So, so it's, it's, it's a different domain in the way that you treat these phenomena. Because if you mix them up, then you will never confront your depression. It's probably going to stay lingering forever. Right. But if you if you use the that kind of thing of, of being able to transform the the environment and it's it's just a door, then you're going to keep bumping your head against the door. Right. So it's uh, I think it's uh, Bertrand Russell or whoever said something like uh, it's kind of cliche by now, but like, you know, um, 
what is it, uh, kind of accept the things that are immutable, right, and work on the things that are mutable, kind of distinguish between things that can be changed and cannot be changed. Okay. Um, Cool. So I, I would refrain from calling it physical laws, although it's an established term and typically established terms stay around for quite a while, uh, because there is no lawmaker. At least there is insufficient evidence for me to be um, uh, convinced that there is a lawmaker. Uh, and there is no evidence uh, beyond our uh, time space constraints here and now. So I would consi consider them observable regularities. It's kind of a softer thing. And this is especially case in acoustics. Okay, I kind of introduce this by saying how, you know, people coming from physics after decades will come out and say, actually, we cannot predict things accurately at all. Okay. Uh, cool. Sound velocities, blah, blah, wavelength. Uh, I'm going to accelerate slightly uh, just to get to the end of it. Uh, wavelength, okay? I guess this is quite clear to everyone. It's, uh, it's a slightly different uh, drawing in terms of the balls and springs here because you see we have a regular uh, force input. So we have this rotating thing to display uh, a case whereby the first ball is being jerked back and forth periodically. Okay, so if you do this, then you will establish a pattern <coughs> which will be sinusoidal. Okay, and then what you do is, in order to determine the frequency, you look at the period duration or the period length. Okay. Uh, Probably not very interesting to, to get into the details here, but this visualization should be sufficient. So what we're looking at is the smallest period of repetition. Okay, so it's crucial. So you see, we take, in this case, the easiest thing to pick out would be the two compressed uh, balls. And that gives us the wavelength. And then we can calculate the frequency. Okay, you know this number of cycles per second. So not only sine waves have frequency, this lecture has a frequency as well. Want to calculate the frequency of this lecture? Is that fun at all? I mean, it's, it might sound stupid, but actually these are the things that really uh, make bits stick. The way learning operates is that it kind of enters a dark hole, <laughs> if I may use this metaphor, and the more associations it establishes to other terms and totally irrelevant things like ice cream, which is one of my favorite things to mention for an odd reason, and whiskey, which is another thing which kind of, oh, whiskey, you know. Th so th my task is to try to relate this term to as many other possible terms. So I'll just calculate the frequency of uh, this class. How do I do this? Well, what do I need? I need the period duration, right? So this class peaks once a week, right? That's when it happens, right? So I would need to express one week in seconds because frequency is units per second, okay? So how do I do this? Well, I have 60 seconds in a minute. Yeah? I have 60 seconds, 60 minutes in an hour. I have 24 hours a day and I have seven days per week. So the duration of seconds you have to wait for the next class, although I'm not including the end and the beginning of it. But if you calculate the frequency, you don't need to, right? So you're not catching the start of the wave and calculating until the next wave's end. You try to get the same phase, right? So this is a valid uh, calculation at this stage. So I would need, what is this, 604,800 seconds until uh, we reach the same moment next week. Am I doing this right? And then in order to get the frequency, I need to do one over that value, which is 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus six. Okay, so that is uh, micro hertz. Let's so, do it in discrete time domain now. Uh-huh. I was saying let's do it in discrete time domain now. 
Well, this is quite discrete, or what do you mean? No, but to just calculate them. Yeah? We should like, express it in discrete time. Like, oh, what do you mean? I'm not, not getting it. As in, like, you know, samples. Oh, samples. Well, I mean, we are making, this is already quite discrete, right? So we are discretizing time in terms of seconds. So that's our sample rate in that state, and that's in that sense. Right, so it's, it's not a continuum that we consider, we consider slices like that. Okay, so, oh, actually you're not seeing my calculation, that's horrible, sorry. Please alert me because I'm not, uh, not always able to follow that. Oh, you don't see that either. Yeah, now things are messed up. Oh, that's totally messed up. Um, in any case, my calculation is here. Okay, 60, 60, 24, 7, multiplying those things, I don't see this anymore at all, gives me this 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 6. So 1.6 microhertz is the frequency of this class, just so you know. Okay, uh, that's fairly straightforward, I would imagine. Uh, it's actually every class, Excuse me? It's actually every class. Yeah, everything that happens weekly has a frequency of 1.6 microhertz. Yeah, exactly. Uh, cool. Uh, pause and exercise. No, pause and exercise. If you wish to uh, engage with this, it'll be available for you. Don't look at the solution if you want to do the exercise. That's that. Okay, so we've discussed pressure waves. Do you guys need a break? Nah. Nah, come on. Just a half hour left. I mean, anyway, I, I don't imagine you will, you know, be able to uh, give me your continuous intention. So you're probably zoning in and out anyway. And, you know, the video is there. So if it's of your interest, you shall be able to uh, recover. So I'll just keep going. Uh, velocity waves. Okay, so this is where things start to get a bit more complex in terms of imagining it and understanding it. Uh, because pressure waves is something that we kind of see in terms of compression and rarefaction. That makes sense. Now, the funny thing is that we can also express velocity waves. So the thing to understand here is that uh, to, to imagine is which... Uh, ball has the highest velocity at this stage and which one has the lowest velocity okay so the thing is that the ones that have a maximum of pressure or minimum of pressure right this is maximum pressure this is minimum pressure maximum compression maximum rarification okay so these are moving the most right and the ones in the middle are moving the least. So what you get is this 90 degrees phase shift between pressure component and displacement component. Is okay. this like when like basically there's sticker, for example, and the membrane is like pushing in and out? That's, that's basically compression and rarification. Uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's two ways of looking at sound propagation. You can look at velocity waves, you can look at pressure waves. Okay? And this, this starts to become clear. It, it explains many things. For example, if you consider uh, a particle next to a boundary. Okay? So if you consider an air particle next to the wall, you probably know already that the pressure will be maximum against the wall, right? But the velocity will be minimum, okay? Because typically there is no room for the particle to move, and that's also part of the reason why you have higher pressure there, right? They kind of bump <laughs> against the wall, they're squeezed against the wall, right? It's, it's a bit like... Uh, um, how do you call it? Uh, at the gig, you have a pit. G no, what is what kind of pit? What's the name? Mosh pit, right? So if you're in a mosh pit and you're you know against the railing, you have very low velocity, and you have a lot of pressure. Okay, 
So it's a very simple phenomenon in that <coughs> sense, very, uh, I should have said, uh, similar phenomenon in that sense. Okay, velocity and pressure waves with 90 degrees phase shift. So I'll just mention this, and as we, as we talk about this, it will hopefully become clear. But the point is that typically when we describe waves of sound, we are describing pressure waves, okay, because that's what we hear. But actually, if you are technically accurate, you would have to mention whether it's a pressure wave or velocity wave that you're considering because there's different implications, okay? And then the next complex uh, term, which again I will kind of mention, say very few things, and then as we progress, uh, I will keep mentioning it and hopefully uh, make it increasingly clearer. So this term is acoustic impedance, okay? So impedance uh, is something that is analogous to impedance in electronic circuits or resistance. So to simplify this, you could say something like it is the resistance of the medium to these vibrating particles. Okay? So what is your intuition? If I'm talking about a small container and a large container, what would be the difference in acoustic impedance? Volume. Again? Volume. Yeah, yeah, but acoustic impedance, when is it higher, when is it lower? Exactly. If you have a smaller container, if you have a smaller mosh pit, right? Actually, that's a great analogy. I should, I should rewrite all my slides to include mosh pits. Um, then you, you kind of intuit that that's what's going on. You have more resistance, right? You, you have more railings nearby, so to speak, right? So you're more likely to, you know, build up pressure. Okay, now th the interesting thing is that impedance boundaries are reflective. Okay, so uh, this wall is an impedance boundary, but as I said, the room is also an impedance boundary in relation to the wall. So for example, if I have a pipe, I mean not a smoking pipe, because I guess someone would have one in the pocket, but if I had like a, a vacuum tube, which I should actually bring in, maybe, maybe next time. Uh, I can actually demonstrate this, because what you get is that the wave is reflected from the exit, from the end of the tube as well, which is kind of counterintuitive. You have the sense of things reflecting when they're solid, but they're also reflecting when they're less solid. So, believe it or not, one of the reasons, main reasons why we have a flare on a trumpet is to avoid a dramatic drop in acoustic impedance. If you have just a tube, if you were to cut off the flare of the trumpet, you would get much less energy exiting the tube because it would act as a reflective boundary, so the energy would be reflected back into the tube. So the amount of re reflection actually relates to how dramatic the drop or increase in impedance is. Okay, so if you have a sudden, very sudden drop or increase, then you would have more reflection. Okay? Cool. Uh, so, uh, acoustic impedance vectors, I'm not sure I'm gonna uh, try to uh, thoroughly explain this. The fact that acoustic impedance is pressure over velocity is the pinnacle of, um, you know, understanding this well. W why does this, yeah? Can you explain what a scalar or scalar quantity is? Yes, scalar versus vector uh, are the words we use to describe uh, quantities which have a direction and which do not have a direction, okay? So scalar is just a value and vector is a value plus a uh, direction, okay? You can have a 2D vector, you can have a 3D vector, okay? So this kind of tackles more complex things that we do not necessarily... Would you like to go to the toilet or have a break? No, 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 just a bit. Oh, that's cool, that's cool. Um, okay, so th there's quite a few more advanced terms here. I'm kind of letting you glance at it. 
for those of you who get inspired by stuff you don't understand, this should be a treat. And for those of you who get uh, demotivated by difficult to understand stuff, it should also be a treat because you don't really need to understand it anyway. Okay? Uh, but this thing that, that the impedance is pressure over velocity is, is a really interesting uh, concept which might sink in. I had a sense of it fully understanding it in my life previously excluding this very moment, so I, I won't attempt to, to thoroughly uh, explain it. But there you go. Uh, cool. Unbounded waves, acoustic impedance. I'm going to try to wrap it up. There's actually quite a few chapters left here. So we're going to leave acoustic impedance for what it is. I kind of introduced the basic things here the reflections and the rest of it. Okay, so those were the theoretically challenging concepts. And now we're going to look at some more practical stuff leading into the practical. I hope I will see you at 1 o'clock yeah, in 1 and 71. I'm going to explain everything about practicals there. Uh, one thing, as I mentioned, you'll probably be running around campus or other locations with an SPL meter. So we're going to discuss sound pressure level. Uh, so what we're doing is we are technically measuring the sound intensity, level, pressure level. And in acoustics we actually have an issue with this because it's overly complex for entry level understanding. Because we have intensity level and we have pressure level. And they're kind of puzzling as to why this or that. But before we get into that, let me just stipulate that these are technical approaches to sound and they do not directly correspond to our perception. Okay, so again, the monolith of psychoacoustics is there. So even though a dB scale is closer to how we would perceive loudness, if you want to refine this, you get to phones and zones, which are other units of sound level, which are psychoacoustically more accurate. Okay, so this is a kind of a technical approach. Uh, so what we do is we measure the sound pressure level. So the sound pressure is an absolute value. Okay, and typically it is one bar, which is the average atmospheric pressure. Okay, to, to, to think to understand here is that the, the amount of air on top <coughs> of us, so to speak, causes pressure where we are and you probably know that if you climb a mountain the pressure is lower right the the concentration of oxygen thereby is lower and if you're really high on a mountain you might have an issue breathing because there's not enough oxygen okay so this is this is a kind of a continuous thing down here we have fairly high pressure and quite a lot of oxygen now, sound is a pressure variation on top of this absolute value. Okay, and in relation to the absolute pressure here, it is very minute. Okay, and then the ears, they have the ability to compensate for the absolute pressure, which takes some time. So, typically, if you climb, you fly, or, you know, change elevation dramatically, you will feel pressure in your ears. Ha, huh, I shouldn't have said pressure. But you, you feel kind of um, pain, almost, in your ears, because you, the membrane is kind of ventilating on both sides, equalizing the pressure uh, on both sides. Okay? But actually, it's not a different phenomenon, right? So, we have one absolute pressure, absolute air pressure, and on top of that we have these variations, which I kind of describe with the 3D ocean surface, meaning that at every location it is rather different. Okay? Uh, so that is absolute pressure. Now, sound pressure level, and typically in acoustics everything that has the word level added to it, means that it is expressed as a ratio, it is expressed in decibel. Okay, so what we do then typically with dBs, is that we have a threshold of hearing and we consider this the uh, reference value. 
Okay, so I introduce the dBs, you understand that it's a not, not an absolute, I cannot say I'm 3 dB years old. It's not a way of uh, claiming an absolute quantity, but I can say I am 3 dB younger or older than someone else. So there has to be a reference in order to be able to use decibel values. Okay, and therefore we can use it all over. I can express the distance between places in decibel, obviously everything that has to do with acoustics and quite a few things more. What about the tropic though? Because like, in tropic they say like you need to have zero decibel. Tropic? True peak. True peak. Yeah. Uh, so uh, zero dB, th this, that's a totally different discussion by the way because it has to do with levels in the digital sound domain where you have the zero dB uh, as a reference for maximum level, okay? It's actually a good thing that you mentioned this because it might clarify the context here. So if we talk about sound pressure level in acoustics, then zero dB, the reference value, is the threshold of hearing. It is the softest sound you hear at 1K. If we talk about level of digital audio, then we don't know what is the softest sound, we know what is the loudest possible sound, so suddenly 0 dB is the maximum value. And then you express softer values by saying minus 6 dB, minus 12 dB, and so on and so forth. Okay? So in acoustics, sound pressure levels start at 0, and uh, here are the absolute values, kind of micropascals to 20 pascals. Here is some calculation. So this is what you've seen me do with age as well. 20 times log of a ratio. Okay? So uh, the reference pressure level is 20 micropascal, but you won't need to calculate these things. So uh, I won't get into that. Now, uh, the sound intensity level actually has to do with the relationship of flow of energy through a unit area. Okay, so suddenly there is another uh, term introduced, which is uh, area that we're looking at. And in fact, what you can consider is that um, sound pressure level is something that uh, changes with distance of the source. Okay, whereas also we also have an acoustical quantity which relates to the power at the source. So there is no distance there. And which is sound power level and sound intensity level. This does get a bit obnoxious. The sound intensity level actually has to do with the size of the receiving area. Right? That's what we're talking about, flow of energy through a unit area. Okay, so it, it has to, it, it introduces the, the surface of the receiver, so to speak. Okay, so uh, just so you know and you don't get confused, there's these three things and it's obnoxious. Typically, what we're going to deal with is just the sound pressure level. That's going to be the simple thing. We're going to get an SPL meter. You will be able to read it out. You can remember basic things like 120 dB is painful. 0 dB is something that I barely hear, or probably not. 30 dB is a quiet bedroom, 40 dB is a quiet living room, and so on and so forth. And I'm guessing these values is probably off by few dB anyway. Okay? This is used for digital audio, No, this is acoustics. There is no digital audio here whatsoever. Only acoustics. Okay, we're not going to deal with digital audio in this class at all. Yes, dB is as I started with, I can express my age relationship to you in dB. I can express anything in dB. It's, it's a unitless uh, uh, way of describing relationship mm -hmm. rather than absolute quantity. Okay, so it, dB can be used in digital audio, but we're not going to discuss that at all. So I'm not going to discuss the, the laughs and all the rest. I think you will do that after, straight after, right, with Luke. He's going to be doing a lot of that. 
Okay, so just to know, sound pressure level is the basic thing that we use. Sound intensity level is slightly more complex. Sound power level is more complex. You're not going to need this necessarily, but it's good to know that if someone starts to talk about intensity, it's not the exact same thing in sound pressure. Okay, now let's look briefly at combining sources and how things pan out. The main thing to understand here is the difference between correlated sound sources and uncorrelated sound sources. So there is a dramatic difference between how things pan out between correlated and uncorrelated sources. Okay, so the thing is that if you have a correlated source, one of my dear, uh, uh, what is it, expressions, stupid analogies, metaphors, who cares, is that acoustics is funny and actually signal processing as well, because one plus one equals how much? <laughs> Again, I'm trying to, you know, say something that you will remember. What an idiot. One plus one is, it's not three. <coughs> Obviously, it's not two. I wouldn't be asking. It's one. Okay, so the point is that if I add two sine waves of the same frequency, what do I get? I get a single sine wave. So one plus one is one. So it's just a, a kind of a, a stupid, you know, what's going on uh, type statement that hopefully gets you into the mood of discovering how to think about these things. Because we may not think of uh, acoustical facts as apples in a basket, whereby adding one to one gives us two because if it's apples in my analogy sine waves of the same frequency and you add them together it's still a single sine wave and you'll never be able to recover the fact that you've built it from two sine waves right so they kind of merge irreversibly which is funny I like that Okay, so th that's what we're looking at. Now, in terms of how they merge, you probably know that they can merge constructively and destructively. We call this constructive interference, destructive interference. I'll talk about this in a second. So in any case, a correlated source is a chapter that kind of relates to this in that two sine waves of the same frequencies are correlated, right? So adding them up would do funny things. And what are the situations typically in our environment where we have correlated sources? Well, evidently, if you play the same signal from multiple loudspeakers or if you have a reflection. OK, so when we talk about reflections, try to think about the reflection coming in. Whereby one plus one is one and not two. So the reflections are not there on top of the uh, direct sound, but they essentially merge in a way that it cannot be reverse and engineered. It cannot be extracted back to what it was without the reflection. So it's, it's, it's a kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, adding sugar to your coffee, right? Although there probably is a way of extracting it back again. Anyone is into chemistry? No, I know you can extract like salt by cooking. So you yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can definitely get the vapor out. We can get the water out if we keep cooking the coffee. We will get a kind of a sediment. But I'm sure. And then crystallizing the sugar out of it. Probably there is a way of doing it. And in acoustics, less so. Okay. So that's the story of correlated source sources and what you get is interference and then we have uncorrelated sources okay so if there is a lot of reflections in the path of a sound wave then the the sources or the waves are increasingly uncorrelated okay so it's not absolute because it's the same source but the more reflections, the less correlation. 
And then obviously, if you have multiple different sources, they are typically totally uncorrelated. We will have a little exercise with this because the funny thing is, for example, if I have two white noise generators, they are uncorrelated, but I can't hear the difference between them. Whereas if I have one uh, white noise source, it is strictly correlated and I still can't hear the difference. So your ear is not the absolute judge of correlation unless you do a neat experiment whereby it's obvious, which is something we will attempt. Okay, so that's uncorrelated sources. So if you have correlated sources, what you get is interference. This is something that you probably know already. So what we're looking at is typical scenario of uh, different distances from source and the receiver. And what you get then is either amplification or uh, attenuation of the sound based on the frequency in relation to the distance difference. Okay, so this is also something we will attempt to experiment with in a bit at one o'clock. Okay, so that will be uh, obvious at that stage. Interference, the nice thing is that you actually get these interference patterns. Okay, so if you have these two speakers emitting correlated sound, meaning exactly the same signal, then what you will get is interference patterns. So if you look straight down the line, you see you get reinforcement here, you get increased gain, and then as you move in the space, obviously this depends on the frequency and distance, but it's kind of a generic pattern you may expect. Then you will find a null point where this sound does not really come through. You will find another maximum point, null point. So you get this kind of interference pattern. But isn't it supposed to be like the other way around where the source is the loudest and then it's decreasing? What do you mean supposed to be? Like because here, according to yes. that diagram, like the source is like the gain is the smallest when it's closer to the source. Uh, no, this is the interference pattern. It's not the absolute gain of uh, okay. of transmission, right? So it's just the interference pattern, uh, which is something that you can see also in spectral domain. Okay, so you get comp filtering. Right? So this is interference in spatial domain. So if you have a fixed frequency, then you will have different uh, interference, either constructive or destructive, in, at different locations. But if you are in a single location, then your interference pattern appears in frequency domain, such that certain frequencies are louder and certain are not. Is this fully true or is there a comment to make this more accurate? There is, you could expect it, which is, unless you're in the middle. <laughs> okay, because if you're in the middle, then everything has a constructive interference as a consequence because the it, distance is the same. As soon as the distance is different to two sources of correlated sound, then the interference depends on frequency. Right, so now I'm in fixed position, not in the center, and this is the spectral characteristic of interference. Certain frequencies are elevated, certain are attenuated. Okay, briefly, the inverse square law. This will also become apparent as we uh, proceed with the practical, measuring uh, sound pressure level at different distances. There is this rule of thumb, which you might know already, doubling the distance will decrease intensity level by 6 dB. Okay, Effect of boundaries, I kind of talked about this uh, already. The point is that uh, the presence of a boundary, it's kind of intuitive but not necessarily, makes things louder. Okay, So I don't know if I can simulate this with, uh, with some solid object. Uh, maybe with this. So if I'm talking to you, would this work? I don't know. I like silly experiments, right? So I'm talking to you at a fixed sound level, and I suddenly do this, and supposedly my voice is a bit louder, and if I remove these, it's less loud. Okay. So the level that you receive 
at the point where you're set does not only depend on how loud I'm speaking, it depends on the vicinity of boundaries. And if I have boundaries near me, reflective boundaries, then more energy will be projected in your direction and you will hear things as louder. Okay? So typically, what is interesting then is if you have a deader room whereby there is less reflection from the walls, right? It is more silent, right? If you have a very dead room, you need bigger speakers to pump the same level into your ears. Okay? Uh, combining levels, we kind of discussed this in terms of interference. Okay? Uh, fairly straightforward. And then there is math to it. Okay? So, um, we'll see if we get to any detail here. Probably not, but... Uh, that's the math for those of you who are interested. So there is a difference between correlated sources and uncorrelated sources. I won't bore you too much with this. That's for your reference. Here's a bit about power levels, intensity levels, and sound pressure levels. The, how you go between these. We kind of omit this because students complaining. <laughs> <laughs> in the past that this is a bit too much. Okay, a concept which is very interesting is superposition. So it's, it's kind of a flaw of the model we have in terms of considering things uh, sound as waves or arrows. The funny thing is that um, the, the difficult thing to understand is how can a sing, sim, single medium have multiple waves going in different directions at the same time, right? So this is typically something that is pertinent if you try to understand strings. So if you look at the vibrating string, supposedly it vibrates at the lowest mode, so the middle bit goes up and down. That's your fundamental vibrational mode. And then the next harmonic essentially necessitates that the center is fixed. And the two halves go up and down like this. And then you're supposed to imagine this to be possible. Right, which is kind of tricky. So if you want to dig into this superposition of waves is the term to look up. I won't go uh, into much detail here. Here is an example which kind of hopefully makes it a bit more understandable. So if you have two waves traveling in opposite direction, they will meet and they will come apart and they will not necessarily interact at all. Okay, that's, that's the property of medium, that's the property of sound. You can imagine me speaking to you, you speaking to me, and the two sounds do not interfere. They do not interact in any way whatsoever. Okay, velocity boundaries. So what we have there is refraction. If you have a different velocity from different medium, you get reflection, but what you also get is direction change. Okay, just you know, we won't be doing much of this there is not much uh, practical uh, use for this. Outdoor refraction is something that is somewhat more practical. So because uh, temperature reduces with height, you actually get a sound shadow. So if I have a sound emitted here, right, then it kind of travels up, which has to do with refraction. Okay, so the, the change of temperature in the medium acts as a curving uh, thing, if I may. Okay? Uh, well, it, it depends on many things, you know, it depends on the reflection, it, it depends on this phenomenon. But indeed, uh, I mean, I, I kind of had, I'm running out of time, but uh, the thing is that if you, for example, work with uh, noise reduction, for environments, it gets really tricky, and you don't know what's going to happen depending on wind and all the rest. Hello, Luke. We're just finishing. Okay, so that's that, and these are your revision tasks. If you're interested, please go ahead, and I'll see you guys at 1 o'clock in 1 and 71. Thank you for your attention.